Bible this morning, turn over to Nehemiah chapter number 2. Thank you, choir, for that. And uh, Nehemiah chapter number 2. I want to speak to you on this subject this morning, praying through your problems. Anybody got any problems this morning? <laughs> Most of the time, if you're breathing, you do. And if you don't know the Lord, you've really got one. Uh, that is your main problem if you don't have a relationship with the Lord. Uh, but we're going to be looking at, uh, I think it's interesting that they chose the song. Sometimes it takes them out. But what we see, I think, in the life of Nehemiah, uh, in chapter number 2, things begin to move. You might say mountains begin to move. You might say God began to work. God's always doing more than we think he is, isn't he? He absolutely is. So uh, as you find that text, would you stand? We're going to read the scripture again. Nehemiah chapter number 2, beginning with verse number 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lie waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make thy request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant hath found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send unto me, send me unto Judah, and to the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over uh, till I come unto Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to to the good hand of my God upon me. You can be seated. Praying through your problems. A lot of interesting things have been said about problems. I read where someone said life is full of problems and predicaments. As one has said, right now you either are a problem, you have a problem, or you live with a problem. I've also noticed through the years that... Uh, and this is just an observation that I've made through the years is that most folks are concerned more about their own problems than anyone else. I've noticed if you, uh, just as a pastor, just an observation that I've made through the years, you've heard me say this before about people having surgeries, uh, the difference between minor and major surgery. Well, it's minor if it's on someone else. It's major if it's on me. We just have that tendency. It's human nature, and you know that certainly we do much better, and oftentimes the way to alleviate some of our own problems is to be more concerned about others' concerns. Certainly we know that's a principle in the Word of God. Uh, just want to throw one more uh, thing out to old Coach Lou Holtz. Uh, said this one time, he said, don't tell your problems to people. 80% don't care, and the other 20% are glad that you have them. Hey, that may be true <laughs> as well. I believe it is. Sometimes. There's a lot of different lessons that you can learn from the book of Nehemiah. Lots of different lessons. It's a great lesson, some great lessons on leadership, lessons on revival, lessons on rising out of ruins. That's exactly what happened in the city of Jerusalem through the leadership of Nehemiah. How God brought a people together and how they accomplished something that had took, they had allowed to go on for 150 years and in 52 days, in the will of God, completely rebuilding the walls. That's a miracle in and of itself. 
So there are countless, countless lessons that we can talk about. But in this particular text this morning, I think we get some insight about how we can learn to pray through our problems. Pray through our problems. Uh, certainly, Nehemiah knew how to do that. Uh, he knew what God had put in his heart. And his biggest issue was connected with what God had put on his heart. He knew what God wanted to do, but he had no idea how God was going to bring it to pass. So he began to pray. And he began to pray through the situation. And we're introduced to the process, I think, in the text that we read today. He was looking for God's mercy in his mission. In fact, in verse number 11, he said these words, O Lord, in chapter 1, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So the first obstacle that was in Nehemiah's way is he had to get permission to go. He served in the king's court. He was the king's cupbearer. So he had to get permission to go. And we see in the text that as he prayed through his problems, God just began to work. And God began to open doors. And God began to work through a lot of obstacles. Well, that was one obstacle when the king let him go. Uh, a second obstacle, as I've already mentioned, is if you do the time study on the return of the, the, the people of God back to the city of Jerusalem, what you realize is that not only had they overcome the obstacle of the king let him go, but they'd allowed, they, were, they had grown accustomed to the situation that they were in, the people in Jerusalem. They had grown accustomed to sitting amongst ruins and walls that were not being built for their security and for their safety. She had to deal with the indifference of the people just used to the status quo. But well, we're all right. We've made, we made it 150 years without this. But the thing was, as the Bible says, it was a time of reproach and ruin. And God was not being glorified nor his purposes being carried out. They would also be under constant attack and criticism. How many of you know if you ever want to do anything for God, you're going to be criticized? It doesn't matter what it is. There's going to be criticism. There's going to be somebody, most of the time, it's not the people that are doing anything themselves. It's always somebody on the sidelines. Maybe a spectator. Uh, like Maybe like some Monday morning quarterback, everything is done. And most of the time, those are the ones who are not doing anything. Because I've found through the years, if you're busy rowing the boat, you don't have a lot of time to rock the boat. Amen? So all those were obstacles that had to be overcome. Just right off the bat. But the good news is when we talk about dealing with something everybody's got, we all have difficulties, we all face adversity, we all work through problems, and the way we need to do it is learn how to pray through them. So first of all, I want you to understand, when it comes to praying through our problems, I believe first of all, we've got, to, we've got to get this in our mind, that we must believe in the willingness of God to hear us when we pray. When times are silent, maybe we're not getting a lot of response, maybe God's not immediately answering our prayers, you know what happens? We think, well, God's not, why is not nothing happening? Why is God not hearing what I'm saying? If you notice there in verse number 1 again, I want you to see it says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was set before him. And I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Now they wanted eastern monarchs were sheltered. They didn't want anything to upset the king. And if you were in the court of the king, if you were kind of whispering around or you weren't all, always happy, well, they thought immediately, maybe you're a traitor. That's the reason that Nehemiah immediately said when he was asked about his expression on his face, he said, let the king live forever. That's what I was saying. I'm not out for your job, king. Let the king live forever. The Bible was on to say that the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And of course it made him afraid. And then he stated his reason why he was upset because God's people in God's city were sitting in reproach and ruins. 
First step, if you're going to work through your problems through prayer, you've got to believe that God's willing to hear you and answer you. Sometimes I think we get the notion that God doesn't. And I think immediately it would be good for you and me to understand the difference between the throne of our Xerxes and the throne of grace. And you need to see this. This is, in, this is important to see. What's the difference? Well, one is Nehemiah had to wait for an invitation to speak, didn't he? What's on your heart? What's on your mind, Nehemiah? You can talk to me. But aren't you glad that we can approach the throne of grace anytime, any, any, with any need, with any burden? And you don't have to wait for an invitation. The Bible says that you can draw boldly to the throne of grace. That means you don't even have to worry about how you say or what you say. Because God knows what you're going to say before you say it. So we can approach the throne of grace anytime for any need. We don't have to wait for an invitation. Also, you notice in this that Artaxerxes saw the sorrow on Nehemiah's face. But could it just remind you that, that God not only sees the sorrow on our face, but he realizes the sorrow within our heart? He knows what is on our mind even if we can't put it into words. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what we're feeling. That's the wonderful thing about the willingness of our God to hear us when we pray. Nehemiah had to choose his words carefully with Artaxerxes. But aren't you glad that you can approach God with anything on your heart? Any burden, any difficulty, it doesn't matter. Because when you begin to pray through a problem, the first thing you need to realize is that our God is willing to respond and willing to hear us when we pray. Secondly, when you're praying through your problems, you must also understand that waiting is a part of the process. Now, we don't like that part. We like to pray and God immediately answer. Now, he does that sometimes, doesn't he? Sure he does. But you know what I find in the Word of God? That more often times than not, waiting is a part of the process. Almost in every occasion. Could it just remind you that there's four months time between the end of chapter 1 to chapter number 2. Four months. Now that doesn't seem like a long amount of time, but it's a very long amount of time when you're praying specifically about a request and you're looking for God to answer, right? Waiting is oftentimes part of the process. Nehemiah had wept and prayed, but now it was time to wait and pray. When I talk about waiting in your prayer, you're not waiting, doing nothing, sitting around, but as you're, you're praying, as you're waiting. And I'm convinced sometimes, folks, listen, we stop long before the answer comes. James Merritt told this story. Some of you ladies may like this, some may not. About a little girl, she's about five years old, who was watching her mother in fascination putting cold cream on her face. And she was rubbing that in, and she asked, Mom, why are you doing that? And the mother said, well, to make myself more beautiful. Well, to the little girl's amazement, in just a minute, the mother began to take the cream off her face. And the little girl said, what's the matter, Mom? You give it up already? <laughs> I think sometimes that's how God looks at our puny prayer life sometimes. What's the matter, King? Are you giving up so early? Waiting is part of the process of praying through your problems. I'm convinced sometimes the reason that I have to wait is I'm not ready for the answer. And sometimes I believe what I'm asking for is not in the will of God. So that's the reason we must always pray according to the will of God. Waiting is a part of the process. The willingness of God to act. But I also believe when you're waiting, you know what we ought to be doing? We ought to be praying for God to respond or preparing for God to respond. If God were to answer your prayer today, how would you respond? Would you be ready for the response? 
Because sometimes I think we would be shocked if God answered that which we're praying about. I think about Acts chapter 12. You remember the story when Peter was in prison he was going to be executed the next day and they were praying at the house of Rhoda. And God miraculously set Peter free out of prison. I mean, an angel came in, liberated him, they walk out and walk in there and Peter is knocking on the door of the house where the prayer meeting was going on. And he read the story and it's almost hilarious because it's almost like she didn't believe it. She shut the door and said, this, Peter's out here. Well, that's what they were praying about, right? So when I talk about praying through our problems, it's preparing for the answer when it comes. Being ready. Nehemiah had planned and prepared. When the answer came, he was ready to go. You know how I know that? Because the Bible says that the king asked Nehemiah. The king said unto him in verse number four, For what dost thou make request? Now, Nehemiah, mind you, had been praying about this for four months. And when the king asked him what was on his heart and what was he going to ask for, you notice what he did? He sent one of these little telegraph prayers, one of these minute prayers. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Now, I want you to know he didn't bow down. He didn't do this in the king's presence. I believe he just prayed under his breath. I don't think he shut his eyes. I mean, anything that would make the king think anything was wrong with Nehemiah. But he prayed immediately to the God of heaven. And then he was ready because he laid out the request. How did he do that? Because he was ready for the answer. He didn't have to say, wait a minute, king, let me put my plan together and I'll be getting back to you. No, no. He was ready. Because he had prepared himself for God to answer his prayer. I think that's important. And I also think it's an act of faith on our part when we are preparing for the answer when it comes. Took a lot of preparation on Nehemiah's part. He even knew who the keeper of the forest was. Asaph. So he'd done his legwork. He'd done his research. He was ready for God to move. He didn't know when it was going to happen or how. But he was ready. When the time came, preparation displays faith. And can I just say something? Especially in the day that we're living in, and just to be an encouragement to those of us that we're, we're in a hostile political climate, can, can I just remind you of this very truth that encourages my heart? I know God can work through dedicated believers like me and mine. There's no doubt in my mind. But throughout all of history, God can also work through ungodly leaders and unbelievers to accomplish His will. He's not limited by anyone at any time, anywhere. Just look at the Bible, for example. Don't you know that God used Pharaoh in Egypt? Pharaoh thought he was in control. God was calling the shots. God used Cyrus to deliver his people from Babylon. It was Caesar that issued the decree that moved Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem to fulfill a prophecy. So listen, folks. As God's people, our trust should be in the living God. That's where our trust should lay. We prepare for the answer as we're waiting for it to come. In praying through our problems, we realize our God is willing to hear us when we pray. Sometimes you gotta wait. How often, I believe it was David Jeremiah said, isn't it amazing how when you go to a restaurant, you're the one that's waiting, but the person that's bringing you the food is called the waiter. <laughs> None of us like to wait. But you can't get away from that principle in God's work. The last thing I want you to see, because it's amazing that the Bible says that God's favor 
through Artaxerxes was on Nehemiah. Now again, that's one of those terms that we've allowed a, a certain group to steal away from us. But I do believe there is such a thing as the favor of God in the will of God. And the Bible says, I, I believe that what we must do and understand this principle because prayer comes out of our relationship, doesn't it? It sure does. We must position ourselves for God to answer. We've got to position ourselves for God to answer. I love what it says in verse number 8. Where it reminds us that this is that the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. The good hand of God. This is a phrase that was, was, was stated similar in the book of Ezra. And now Nehemiah used this a lot. God had granted favor unto Nehemiah to carry out his will. The good hand, the way Nehemiah described the good hand of his God was upon him. Why is that? I think you go back to chapter number one. He had positioned himself through prayer and confession of sin so that he might pray rightly in accordance with the will of God. Positioning ourselves for God to answer. It's through faith. In whom we're talking to. That is what turns our burdens into blessings. There's no better way to position ourselves for God to answer. Just an old fashioned word I'm going to throw out there for you. Are you ready? Obedience. Obedience. We don't hear a lot about that in our day. Obeying what God's word says. Obeying what God tells us to do. Because when I'm doing that, I am positioning myself in my relationship with God, just as Nehemiah had in chapter number one, as he prayed and he sought the will of God and he confessed his sin and he claimed the promises of God, knowing what the will of God was through the word of God, and he positioned himself for God's blessing through obedience. Now let me just say this. Just because you obey what God wants you to do, it doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer. There's a dear pastor that has been recently arrested and been incarcerated in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, for just simply preaching. And throughout history, same thing. Just because you're obeying God, just because you're doing what God wants you to do, does not mean in any way that you won't have to suffer, that you won't get sick, that you won't go through difficulty, or even that you may fail. But we should always obey God. I know you say that's a simple statement, but it's true. It's all about obedience. And the reason I say that, you know what happens? When we, as God's children, put ourselves, when we disobey God, we put ourselves in, I guess you could say, kind of a critical position. We do. You say, well, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, listen, when you're in fellowship with God, you can have confidence when you pray, right? When your sins are confessed, when your heart is clean. Now listen, sometimes we think, well, I've done all that and God's not answering. Well, how do you know he's not? Maybe you just don't know it yet. When we get outside of the guardrails of God's perfect goodwill, we subject ourselves to the consequence of sin. How many of you know sin will just flat make you stupid? It will. I know that, you know, that's not a very theological term, but I understand it. It will absolutely do that. Because we forget that there's always consequences to disobedience. Yes, you can be forgiven of your sin. Thank you, Lord. But there are always consequences. To my disobedience. Without fail. You cannot change. The law so it and read it. You cannot change it. It just does not work that way. It's pretty clear that. When you look at the life of Nehemiah. The loudest voice. In his life. Was the voice of God. 
Do you hear what I'm saying? When it comes to the life of Nehemiah, the loudest voice in his life was the voice of God. He was tuned in and had his ear toward God so that he might be able to hear. That's the way obedience starts, isn't it? That's the reason it's so important for us to gather for worship. We need each other. We need to be together. We need to worship. Amen? Amen. We need that. Because through that, obedience starts with an ear that is bent toward what God is saying. Eugene Peterson said it like this. He says, as sure as your sin will find you out, the blessings of God will always catch up with a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction. You don't always see the results immediately, but it don't mean they're not coming. It doesn't mean they're not coming. What Nehemiah is reminding us in this text, I believe, by his example and just by the, the very narrative of the text, is that we should measure, you and I should measure our problems by the greatness of God. He said it's all about perspective, didn't he? We should measure our problems by the greatness of God. Therefore, we can see obstacles as opportunities and problems as possibilities as we are learning to live by faith. As we learn to live by faith. You may have all kinds of stuff going on. In your life right now. Let's just be honest. Sometimes we experience problems we bring on ourselves. Amen. And we did it. I've done it. We've all done it at some point. You say, what do you do in that case, preacher? Well, you just get as hard, your heart as right with God as you possibly can. And just keep walking forward. There are other problems we experience because of others. Sinfulness or disobedience. What do you do about that, preacher? You get your heart right with God as you possibly can, and you just keep walking forward. You can't control what other people do. If anybody knows how to do that, please see me after the service. I'd like to know your secret. Problems come in all shapes and sizes, but what we must learn to do as God's people is stop being whiners and complainers and be prayers. And seek the face of God. That he may work through our hearts and lives. Can I just say to you this morning, in, in all humility, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I can tell you what your number one problem is. You need the Lord. You need the Lord. You need Christ. That's your number one problem. You may think it's other things. You may think it's somebody else, but I'm just telling you, that's your number one problem. And today, you can trust Christ and ask him to forgive you of your sin, and he will change your heart. But I think for those of us that are God's people, we've got to learn a different way. So that we might be a better testimony to those that are unsaved. So that when we they see us going through pain, that I, the first thing we do is we pray through our problem. And we seek him first. And I believe God can teach us how to do that just like he can teach us everything else. But you've got to be willing to work with him. Let's pray again. Father, you know what is going on in the